The position of men with regard to fatherhood is made clear with the title of this show. Regular pictures of fathers protesting about their rights to see their children. In this country, married or not, a father has no automatic legal rights to access. On the one hand, fathers are seen as a vitally important pillar of family when he's together with the mother. But as soon as they split up, a transformation takes place, which turns the man into a completely unnecessary and even dangerous presence. The mother is, for whatever reason, doesn't want the father to see his children. Now, I can understand the father who wants to see his children. We'd be extremely aggrieved if the court um, says that he doesn't think contact is, is, is appropriate in that situation. Um, there may be, however, be very good reasons why the court considers it not in the child's best interest for the father to have contact. Uh, there also may be very good reasons why they might order that contact to be supervised contact. Why haven't you seen them? Well, I tried it first, but Maggie made it very difficult. I only had these supervised visits with a social worker that had watched me. It was like I was a criminal. You know. Children have been exposed to dangerous fathers far too frequently where the courts actually should reject contact. Women's Aid was sat there for one reason and one reason only, and that was to make sure that after divorce or separation, wherever humanly possible, those fathers did not see their children again. That was their single overriding objective. On divorce or separation, he's typically removed from even seeing his children and labelled a criminal stalker if he tries to see them against the mother's will. His only remaining purpose in the eyes of the law is to make monthly cash payments to the mother. One father lived just one street away from the mother and he saw the mother walking down the street with his little girl and so she ran to him saying, Daddy, 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 and the mother literally pulled the child away from her father in the middle of the street because it's like it's not your contact time. Basically, a mother's whim is a sole deciding factor as to the importance of a father in a child's life. Your wife still insists that following the divorce they live solely with her. Until then, they can continue to spend one night a week at your apartment. Well, why can't they after our divorce? Your wife maintains that long term that would be disruptive. What? A judge may sympathise. You will, of course, have visiting rights. No, 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 that's not good enough. Proper access, OK? Yeah, I want to be a father to my children, not just, you know, the bloke who takes them to McDonald's once a month. I spoke to a lawyer about men's parental rights. What rights do unmarried fathers automatically have? Automatically, they don't have any right automatically, but they have an automatic right to apply for rights. They have a standing. I think it's really important to remember when people say unmarried fathers have no rights or there's a lack of rights and that unmarried fathers need rights. We need to think about who are these unmarried fathers and it can be all sorts of situations. Somewhere we're going to be very sympathetic towards them having rights and other scenarios where actually the thought of giving an unmarried father an automatic right, an automatic right would be quite inappropriate. There's some stranger rapist or some uh, anonymous um, one night stand doesn't really tell us much about the nature of those people, their ability to parent or their suitability to parent. If a woman decides to have a baby after sex with a man that she barely knows, where he might not even know he's a father, I'd say the woman's suitability to parent is far more at issue than the man's. Carol was hoping you might help her find out who its father is. <laughs> <laughs> You mean you don't know who it is? All she knows is that it happened at New Year's Eve at your party. What, the fancy dress? At about 10 o'clock. But yeah, there should be a process put in place by which father gets automatic parental responsibility. The mother, after all, gets automatic parental responsibility, whether she is a terrible mother or not. Um, it's, there, there's no qualification for becoming a mother or a father. Um, you can't have a mother automatically becoming a mother with no test, with, with, with no discretion and then say the father must prove himself. That's, that's ridiculous. But many women would say that the test was a nine-month pregnancy. Um, a nine-month pregnancy does not test your ability to bring up a child, it doesn't test your patience, you doesn't, there's an enormous amount of, of, of infanticide that, that the mother actually commits. Um, the way I was brought up, all the all the all the physical punishment came from the mother. There is there is this kind of fairy tale attitude of of the woman being very soft and loving and, and naturally motherly, which I think women would resent. Um, and it's it's not true. There is a, you know carrying a, a baby to term does not does not make you a nice person. <laughs> carrying a baby to term does not make you a caring, kind, and soft person. It just makes you a person who's carried a baby to term. 
But even if we ignore irresponsible mothers, the law's treatment of fathers doesn't make sense. One of the automatic rights they have is the right to support their child. That's often seen as a responsibility rather than a right, but the difference between right and responsibility isn't that clear-cut sometimes. Well, it seems really clear-cut when it comes to fathers. Sex with a woman that leads to a baby is either significant or it's not. It confers rights and responsibilities on the father, or it confers neither. One cannot say that having sex is such a serious undertaking that it can automatically lead to 18 years of financial responsibility for a man, yet at the same time it's so unimportant that the man should have no automatic parental rights. How can this be happening to men in what is so often described as a male-dominated society? That's disjuncture between financially supporting a child but not actually um, necessarily having the right over that child isn't necessarily a conflict if you think, well, the purpose of law is to protect the welfare of the child. I think there's something a bit unpleasant about the idea that if, because I'm paying for the child, therefore I have the right to see the child. It rather reduces a child to some sort of um, a hired purchase car agreement or something, where it's an object somehow. And it's, you know, one of the famous judges in this area, um, Justice Sloss, Butler Sloss, said, you know, a child is a subject, not the object of concern. If you, you need to think about what's in the child's best interest before the father. And again, it comes back to the distinction between fathering as an activity and fathering as a status. If you have the status of a father, um, you should pay for the child. That's your duty to pay for the child. It's not fair that, that women have complete power over whether a father, whether a man becomes a father. Um, and that's the bottom line. A woman has control over whether a man becomes a father. It's not fair, but it's, it's, it's the way of the world. So what you do is you try and protect the father as much as possible. You try and give him as much, many rights as possible. Um, at the, but right now, what we seem to be doing is simply punishing a man who doesn't want to become a father, who a woman has made a father. And that doesn't seem right to me, that you punish him. He should be protected, not punished. the mother tries, remarries and tries to have her children's surname changed to her new married name so that she wants her new nuclear family, her, the stepfather and her children all having the same surname of the stepfather, her new husband. It's relatively easy for a mother to change their child's surname and as little a father can do in this situation, it's futile to turn to the law as the law clearly does not protect men as our first woman law lord, Dame Brenda Hale, made very clear recently. She said uh, it was a very poor kind of parent um, who would insist upon calling the child by its own name. So not only had this man lost his last viable connection with his child in this particular case, but he had been told he was a bad dad for trying to keep any sort of relationship going. How devastating. It's a way of, uh, of, of excluding the father. And what does the father think? Why did the mother do it? It was for reasons to do with her, not, not to do with the child. And to, and to say that he was a bad father because he objected, I mean, I, I'm sorry, with every respect to a very senior judge, this judge doesn't agree. I salute the men of Fathers for Justice who have highlighted the terrible treatment of fathers and children at the hands of mothers and the state. The media has sought to viciously attack the movement and attempts to paint the picture of a league of abusive dads. At the bottom line here, uh, it's quite interesting the Home Secretary raised it, he said we're protecting our way of life and this Labour administration protecting our way of life has resulted in 300,000 children losing partial or As I say, or we're not here to, develop, to talk about the face with two men dressed up in stupid outfits. But it's two separate issues here, Kirsty. Yeah. The, the issue, the the issue no, no, I think, I think what we're Am talking about here, here is security. Or are you going to talk so, just straight but through me, Kirsty? I'm going to ask you questions well, which are relevant them? to a discussion. And, and there could actually have been shots fired today. Isn't that a very dangerous situation? I think it's dangerous. And I think you, want, you have to ask yourself, why are dads doing this? And that's a question you've got to... Several aspects of father's rights literally amaze me. The fact that mothers would want to have a child with a man and then deny him access because he's unsuitable amazes me. If he's unsuitable, why have the child with him in the first place? The fact that courts can order that fathers have access and the mothers can ignore this with impunity amazes me. But what amazes me most about the whole issue is that this has been going on for decades. 
How have these men near silently withstood their treatment at the hands of the mothers, the police, social services and the family courts? But I would not dress up as Batman, but I could fully understand why these people do it, because we don't... Uh, we don't know what's gone on in their lives as well. I, for one, would go crazy under the treatment doled out to thousands of fathers on a daily basis in this country. I try to imagine not being able to see my little boy every day, but I find the thought utterly intolerable. How long have you been involved in trying to well, see your kids? We finished with each other at the end of October 2001. We're now almost at the end of October 2004, and I am basically no further than I was a year after we had separated or had finished. I, or I'd tried with the two solicitors to uh, do things without the courts because I'd heard what the courts were like, but obviously as a woman she knew what the courts were like, so she decided to go through the courts. And I felt that I had to answer, well I know that I had to answer a lot of accusations that were untrue about uh, domestic violence, uh, about uh, my kids are scared of me about beating my kids up, which were totally fabricated. But I felt that I had, well, the courts looked upon me as that person, which wasn't very nice. Have you ever been tempted to give up? Yes, <laughs> quite a few times. Only because the mental abuse that my children would have been getting from the ex misses because your dad's this, your dad's that, and I didn't want them to go through that. And also, uh, and mentally, you, sometimes I can't take it, but within a, two minutes, I'm back there and I'm fighting it again. It's scary because kids do lose their dads, and then they're told that the dads have never wanted anything to do with them, but it couldn't be further from the truth. Every year, what the government calls only 15,000 cases go to the family courts. In just 7% of those cases are men allowed to live with their children. The courts reduce the rest of them to Sunday fathers. Four out of ten fathers lose touch with their children forever. So why does this happen? Why are fathers forcibly removed from their children? While society is changing, what is uh, still the fact is that women take the prime responsibility for caring and bringing up the child. And that's still, you can see that in the patterns of work. You can see that in who's at the school gates picking up the children. Uh, you can see that in who takes the children to the, uh, to the doctors, uh, who takes the children to the dentist. Indeed, but who enables her to do this? Who pays for the dentist bills? Who's sacrificing time with the child so that she can do these things? Nobody appreciates dad. Nobody ever says, hey, daddy, thanks for knocking out this rent. <laughs> hey, daddy, I sure love this hot water. <laughs> hey, daddy, this is easy to read with all this light. If the child is already living with the mum, the judge may well decide that that's in the best interest of the child to continue. Well, that's wrong. Well, that, that's, that may be your view. The whole idea of the primary caregiver and the best interest of the child is flawed. It's simply a weapon used against fathers to belittle them and make it acceptable to remove them from parenting. By arguing that the mother is somehow more important and more relevant for the care of the child, it's easier in our minds to discount the father and regard him as superfluous. But the father is certainly not superfluous. The family is one unit and is indivisible. Any attempt to define the father's role as somehow less important is an attack on family and a hate crime against men. So, for example, in some of these relocation cases, what you've seen being argued on the, let's say it's the father who's worried he's not going to see his children again because he lives in Cornwall and the wife wants to move to Scotland or Australia. Um, he argues that it's in the child's interest to have contact with him as his father. That it's, it, the child will be damaged and will suffer if it doesn't have that contact and it will lose out on that relationship. I only need to assess the family dynamic for the court. Well, it's simple. Carl and I both love our son, but she's trying to take him away from me so her new husband can pursue his career. How do you feel about him? Who, Roger? Yes. He's a decent guy, I guess. Good to your son? Yeah, sure. Loves him? Look, why are we talking about Roger? Who cares about Roger? This is about me, Reese, and Carla. Like it or not, he factors into this. Well, how do you think you'd deal with it if Carla was able to take Reese out of the country? That's not going to happen. If it did? 
On the other hand, the, the mother who's relocating might argue that um, she's got a wonderful job opportunity or that she's going to return to live where her parents come from, possibly, or she's going back to where she's originally from and she wants to bring the child up with the benefit of an, um, an extended family. How are you doing this? Why am I doing this? It's restraining orders and lawyers. Carla, I only have one son. Roger can get another damn job. This is a great opportunity for us, Peter. What about Reese, huh? You ever think about that? I mean, you want to take him away from his father? An extended family and uh, the mother having a good job, and living in a happy relationship with a new Scottish man. Those all might be things that could produce an environment that's going to be best for a child. And again, you have to weigh them up. And it's very difficult, these balancing acts. There's no right or wrong in them. They are balancing acts. There is no complexity and there is no balancing act. If a woman decides to have a child with a man, then she must live with the consequences of that decision. And this includes fewer freedoms to relocate. It's literally amazing that in our supposedly male-dominated society, fathers' rights are up for debate. All the court can ever do is balance the two and try and work out what they think is going to be in the child's best interests. Oh, that's the mantra they use. It's always the best interest of the child. The child's interest is paramount. So they all hide behind that one sentence, but there's an awful lot of people hiding behind what is a very little narrow pillar. I don't know how they all manage to hide behind it for so long. Best interest of the child must be removed from the statutes. It's nonsensical. The best interests of the child are indivisible from the best interests of family. One cannot profess to care about children if you don't also care about the parents. Both parents. The best interest of the child is that he has a mother who is responsible and a choice of father. The best interest of the child is that the father is not removed from parenting. The best interests of the child are that both parents are present and have a biological investment in the child. The best interest of the child as it stands today equates only to the best interests of the mother. And while women may see this as some sort of superior position, a victory of sorts over men, women don't actually win anything. The real winners are government and the legal industry. You have laws that, if you stand them up and put the spotlight all over them, are gender neutral. But the practice of that law, all men will know that if you go into court and your wife, uh, she doesn't even have to get a good solicitor. If she decides that she wants A, B and C, she will get A, B and C. As David Mortar on one of our helplines, his young boy said to him once, those courts you go to, Dad, it's, it's, they actually work along the lines of mum wants and the court does it. And he was only a young lad when he said it to him. But even that young lad was aware that when his mother went to court, if she wanted something, she got it. I think it's got to change the mindset of people rather than the law itself. It's, it's the mindset that women actually think that they are finally right to have the children because they give birth. The continuing nobility of men under these oppressive circumstances is absolutely incredible. A man's not even allowed to be frustrated that he hasn't been able to see his child for years. If he tries to see his children against the mother's wishes, he's a stalker. If he gets angry about being denied contact, he's violent. If he refuses to pay child support without the right to see his child, he's a deadbeat dad. That is not in the best interests of your daughter. Ms Jenkins says she is afraid of you. You are obsessive, aggressive and unpredictable, stalking her in the no, street. No, Karen, I, I wasn't stalking. I just wanted to see Lola. It was the only way I could... Get a glimpse of her, check she was all right. If, if, if you love someone, you worry about them all the time. Mr Flint, you hardly know your daughter, so how can you say you love her? Do you worry about anything that you say and how you behave will have a I bad did. influence? I did. I mean, I do worry how I behave, so you're careful not to... The minute you swear in there, the minute you get, the minute you get annoyed, uh, they say, look, he's like they said. There's no, not the fact of the matter that it's been three years, you've had it up to here. Take, for example, the re requirement to have a welfare officer's report. The government target is 12 weeks. Now, that's three months before you get a report. In fact, it, it, it s seldom takes three months. It usually takes four or five months. Some reports take four or five months to get done from CAFCAS. One report took uh, seven months for them to send, and in them seven months I only see my children three times because my ex-partner has said that uh, the children didn't want to see me. Judges rely on CAFCAS reports to do their jobs. But CAFCAS is a feminist institution, riven with prejudice against men. Most reports are from the viewpoint that fathers are unnecessary to upbringing. They'll typically recommend ridiculous contact arrangements. And if the mother disagrees, then even this doesn't happen. 
the contact I have, the arrangement I have at the moment is three weekends out of four, which is pretty good compared to a lot of dads. But that's because she don't want my children at the weekend so she can go out. But So if it weren't in her interest, it wouldn't be me having the children. Uh, and for a year she wouldn't let me see my daughter. On the whole, there's a huge bias in the court. And as far as the judge is concerned, they, because they have no direct experience of the case, rely totally on the court welfare officers, CAFCAS, for instance, and social work and probation reports. And they will agree largely with, what, with the findings. And the result is they're very, very heavily biased against fathers and in, in favour of mothers. And until we have a system whereby we... we these cases don't come to court until they've been properly mediated. Uh, uh, we're going to go on, this bias will just continue, because the courts are clogged with these kinds of cases. Nobody's interested in them, nobody cares about the income. It's far, far easier to simply hand the children over to the mother and let her do what she wants, which is what women do now. Women have total control. You couldn't have that level of complete control in any other area of life where you share responsibility for something. You can't walk off with a business, or a house, or a car, or even a toaster if it's joint owned. But with a child, that's exactly what a woman can do. Would you say that it's an easy thing for a man to be stripped of his children by a wife or partner? Oh, or is it still a difficult thing to no, actually it's happen? easy. It's, it's frighteningly easy. Um, because the courts, uh, quite simply, at this stage, will not do anything to enforce a court judgement. If, if uh, there's a court order that dad can see the kids every fortnight and mum just says no, 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 no and puts up lots of reasons. I mean she can put up a whole list of reasons at the start. She can accuse him of molesting the children, she can accuse him of domestic violence, um, she can accuse him of a whole list of stupid things that CAFCAS officers will be quite happily putting in a report like he when he brought them home, the kids were tired and he hadn't used the right toothpaste. You know, you, seriously, you get things like that. I've read them in reports. If the mother commits perjury while it's going through the courts, that's OK. No comeback. And then af after he's finally got his contact order, after not seeing those kids for a year or two years, even three years sometimes, um, that he gets his contact order, and then if she doesn't let him see the kids again, you then say... Well, you can't transfer a residence, you can't send her to jail, and you can't fine her, and you can't make her do community work. So I said, so what are you going to put up? The judge makes an order for contact, the mother disobeys. What can the judge do? He can, he can fine the mother or send her to prison. Now, typically she's got no money, so the fine isn't a possibility. So to send her to prison, what does that do for the children? There's a woman obstructing contact, and they think contact should go ahead. Should they be forced to the situation where they put her in prison? The last resort of the court is that they put her in prison. Putting a mother in prison is not in a child's best interest. Now that's where the courts are stuck. They can only do what's in the best interest of the child. Putting the primary carer in prison is not in the child's best interest. Man or woman in court with a silly little thing on their head is, is actually going to do nothing about it. Um, and he will uphold mother's decision on whatever she decides to do. He'll tell her off for being a naughty mum, but won't do anything about it. No, she could take him to the cleaners. I had one mother who said to me, tell, tell him, give me the money and he can have contact. I mean, you're in front of this woman who's saying he can see the kids if he gives me money. Mm. I mean, do you not just go, you fucking bitch? Judges go out of their way to avoid custodial sentences for mothers. They have no hesitation in sending fathers to prison. Indeed, it can even be beneficial for fathers to get jail time. Yet when a mother cheats on taxes, off she goes to jail. Then whoever's been doing that perjury, there's got to be a comeback on that person. And the first comeback will be, well, immediately the, the other parent gets automatic custody of the child because that person, if they're prepared to tell lies that's upset their kids for a year while they've not been seeing dad or mum, then that person is not a fit parent because they've told all those lies. 
women litigants uh, are becoming or have become adept at manipulating the system and the system is capable of being manipulated and if someone is implacably hostile and simply won't give contact and and uh, brainwashes the child against the father then there's very little one can do so what we're saying now is that yeah legal presumption so that you don't give the mother the divine right to just take the house the kids the car off your pension um, and then when you get round to one and see the kids she says no to that as well that's outrageous that's got to be stopped still now the social services doesn't don't see it my way they talk me about me having mediation but I've tried all that and it gets me nowhere and the ex just walks to, she agrees to what they say the next minute she's out there she's doing exactly the opposite uh, yet I'm the one who's uh, following everything by the book. She kept on saying my daughter was scared of me, didn't want to go, so my daughter kept on saying to me, I don't want to go with you, Daddy, and I'll give a basic example of a five-year-old girl last Christmas saying to her, Dad, Daddy, you can give my Christmas presents away. I don't want them. I mean, what five-year-old says that, they don't say that, they've been told to say that. There was difficulty um, seeing my youngest child you know, the, the, I would get, well, you can't see your son today, and she would push him back inside and shut the door and that sort of thing. And I didn't actually see him for about 18 months. Now the mantra is, um, you know, if you put the mother in jail, how is that in the interest of the child? Well, it's in the interest of the child that when she gets out, she won't do it again. But the best this government can come up with, and this really does show the lack of intellectual rigour, the lack of imagination behind this is that if a mother prevents contact, she might be made to pay the dad's expenses if he's booked a holiday. He doesn't want a fucking holiday. He wants to hold his child. Four out of ten mothers, that's 40%, admit to having obstructed contact between children and their fathers. And the family law system does nothing. But the government doesn't want to punish mothers when they remove fathers from their children. Its interests aren't served by doing so. This is not about the best interests of the child, because as we've seen, Government has no problem sending a mother to jail for fiddling taxes. There is no lack of intellectual rigour in the government for this situation. It's a deliberate plan of action to create the circumstances in which fathers can be easily separated from their children. The government has become adept at using the petulance, selfishness and vindictiveness of women to achieve their ambitions for society. This behaviour by government is very far from stupid and very close to sinister. I suspect that if the law were as tilted towards men as it is now to women, we would behave in the same way. I disagree. Men would not behave in the same way as women. The fact that the law is the way it is is proof of that. Men have had ample opportunity in history to bias laws in their favour, yet they've clearly not done so. In fact, men have done the exact opposite and biased laws in women's favour. And this is supposedly a male-dominated society. The mentality of men is bound up in fairness. The innate nobility of men simply doesn't allow for the despicable behaviour so commonly displayed by women. For all what she's done, she's still my kid's mother. She loves my children, she just cannot see what she's doing sometimes. And although they f I feel like they're going to get me down sometimes, uh, I will not let any of them get me down and I will fight to see my children and I will fight until I've got the children living with me. And the funny thing about it is that once I've got my children living with me, I've already got it into my head that I am not going to do to my ex-partner what she done to me. She will get proper access, she will get decent access, her, grand, her parents will get decent access to see their grandchildren. I will not do to them what they done to me. Why not? Two wrongs don't make a right and just to show to them that I'm a better person than them. That I don't hold no grudges, I'm not malicious. And if, if I see it fit, if it, I would, she could take the children back and it seems like I'm saying that and I don't want them but I'm being realistic and practical I, I love my mum dearly I'm close to my mum I know how close kids are to their mums I just feel at the moment she's not suitable for them two years time after she's thought to herself my god I've lost my children I'm a woman I've lost my children I've got to wake up from this hopefully she will do that uh, like I said before, she's the mother of my children. We've seen in some of the other films in this series that although black sprinters dominate the Olympic 100 meters event, this domination does not mean that white sprinters are therefore oppressed. 
All athletes that want to run 100 meters start at the same place, at the same time, and run the same distance, and they all have the same training opportunities. We could take the view, as we do with the 100 meters, that the law is fair and that the opportunity for both sexes to achieve custody is there. It's just that the women are best suited to it. We could say that the fact that fathers don't achieve custody 90% of the time, and often don't even get reasonable visitation rights, is the correct outcome based on fair judgments, and doesn't indicate bias against men, just as the eight black men lining up for the 2008 Olympic final doesn't indicate bias against white athletes. But this doesn't hold water, because we're not comparing like with like. If white sprinters were threatened with never being able to compete again if they dared to try out for sprinting, if they were told that they were not wanted on running tracks, if they were arrested if they tried to go training, if they were told they couldn't go within a hundred yards of a running track because of a court order, if white sprinters were told that they would have to hire a solicitor and fight in court for three years for the right to even put on running shoes, if they were only allowed to train once every two weeks for one hour and for two weeks in the summer, if all this were true, then we could say that white sprinters were treated the same as fathers in the family courts, and that the hundred meters unfairly discriminates against white athletes. However, if those things aren't true, we have to call it the way it is. The family courts unfairly discriminate against men, and this discrimination is based on male hatred. The family courts in their current form represent one of the most evil and most destructive institutions in history.